Hello and welcome to Zoology 141. This is Human Anatomy and Physiology. Today we're going to be starting our first lecture on chemistry, the chemistry of life. In today's lecture we're going to discuss biologically important elements. We're going to learn about the various subatomic particles and learn how the three different types of chemical bonds are formed. We're going to discuss pH and its importance to living organisms. And finally we're going to go through an overview of the major biological macromolecules including carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Now before we can delve into chemistry, we need to go through a little bit of the background vocabulary first. And the first of these terms is matter. Matter is basically anything that occupies space and also has a mass. So pretty much everything around you is matter. The desk in front of you has mass, it also occupies space, so it is matter. And you occupy space and also have a mass, so you're made up of matter as well. As you're probably already aware, there are three distinct states of matter. Solids are matter that has a definite shape and also a definite volume. For example, the ingot or bar of gold at the right is a solid. It has a certain weight or mass, and if you were to measure its dimensions, you could see that it has a very definite shape. Within the human body, there are solids, of course, and these are things like bones and teeth, both of which are solids. Liquids, on the other hand, have a definite volume, but not a definite shape and so you can see the water being poured into the glass and even though that water might be of a specific volume, let's say 200 milliliters, it's going to take up the shape of whatever container that we put it in. So if we put it in a shot glass, we can put it in a bowl and it's going to have a different shape each time. Within the human body, examples of liquids include things like blood, lymphatic fluid, and also blood plasma. The final state of matter is gas. Gas has neither a definitive volume or a definitive shape. And so examples of gases that are important in the human body are carbon dioxide uh, and also oxygen. And these tend to take up the shape of whatever container they're in. Another concept we need to go over is something called energy. And energy is basically just the capability or capacity to do work. And there are two different types of energy that are important kinetic energy, which is basically energy in motion, and potential energy, which is stored energy. So one example of kinetic energy is simply molecular motion. Molecules and solids, liquids, and gases are all moving around. Now obviously they're going to be moving faster in a gas or in a liquid than they are in a solid. But as long as we're not at absolute zero, those molecules are moving. And the rate of molecular motion is affected by heat. If we heat up a solution, the molecules will move around faster and faster. And the faster these molecules move around, the more kinetic energy they'll have. Now let's take a look at potential energy. Remember that potential energy is stored energy. And an example here of potential energy would be a boulder that's resting at the top of a hill. If you live out in Waianae or one of these areas that's very prone to rock falls, you're probably very aware of this problem. So basically at this point, the stationary boulder has potential energy. And that energy is generated by the force of gravity on the boulder. What we need to get that potential energy to convert into kinetic energy is a little bitty push. In this case, we call that push the energy of activation. And the energy of activation is simply the energy needed to get a chemical reaction going. And once that boulder starts rolling down the hill, it will cease to have potential energy, but at that point will have kinetic energy, that is energy in motion. Now potential energy is also important in biological systems because potential energy is what we use to fuel the cellular processes of the body. And we find potential energy in the chemical bonds within the food molecules that we eat. For example, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids all have potential energy, and that potential energy can be converted into kinetic energy in order to fuel the various processes within the body. Another example of potential energy would be the energy stored in the bonds of the gasoline molecules that we put into our car. And we put that gasoline in the car, we add a little bit of heat or a spark, and our car can convert that potential energy in the gasoline into kinetic energy, which can be used to move the car forward. Now there are other forms of potential and kinetic energy in addition to just chemical energy. We said chemical energy was the energy stored in chemical bonds. And some chemicals like gasoline have a tremendous amount of energy stored in them. 
electrical energy is sort of analogous to the energy that we get um, from a battery where we have a cathode and an anode they're separated by an electrolyte and basically electrons flow from one area to the other and that generates a flow of energy there of course is also mechanical energy that is energy of movement uh, when you flex your forearm or extend your forearm that is exerting a form of mechanical energy and finally there's radiant energy or electromagnetic energy these are basically waves of energy which vary in length and are part of the electromagnetic spectrum they include visible light infrared light radio waves UV light and x-rays now we need to talk about energy conversions it's important to realize that energy can be converted from one state to another but that oftentimes this energy conversion is very very inefficient and much of the energy is in fact lost as heat which can usually not be used to do work at least in biological systems for example think about the gasoline engine at the bottom of the slide the gasoline engine harnesses the potential energy stored in gasoline to help drive the pistons which drives the shaft which eventually moves the car forward unfortunately a lot of that energy is lost as heat and this heat can actually be very damaging to the engine and hard to get rid of and that's why cars have to have very efficient radiators to get rid of this excess energy that can't be used but at the same time can actually cause damage to the engine so the bottom line here is yes we can convert energy from one form to another but in general the energy conversions tend to be very inefficient releasing most of their energy as heat which usually cannot be used to do work okay now that we've talked about matter energy and so on we're going to go on to talk about the elements of the periodic table an element is the fundamental or pure form of matter that cannot be broken down into a simpler form by ordinary means and there are 112 known elements which are visible on the periodic table and so the periodic table was included in the folder for this lecture so if you haven't already printed it out please pause the lecture now and do so because you're really going to need this as you go through the rest of this lecture now elements themselves are made up of atoms atoms as we said in the last lecture are the smallest unit of an element that still has the chemical and physical properties of that element so as I said previously the periodic table consists of all of the 112 known elements and the elements can be divided into metals semi-metals and non-metals and if you take a look you can notice that each of these elements is basically represented by an abbreviation for example H is an abbreviation for hydrogen remember that hydrogen is found in carbohydrates but it's also found in a gaseous form hydrogen gas which is very combustible carbon also has a very intuitive abbreviation it's abbreviated as C carbon on the other hand some elements in the table don't really have a very intuitive abbreviation for example find the abbreviation PB now PB is the chemical symbol for lead you would think it would be LE and if you take chemistry class you'll learn the reasons why some of these uh, elements have chemical abbreviations or symbols that don't necessarily coordinate to their English name so there are five major elements that are very important in the human body and these include oxygen which is indicated by the symbol O and that makes up about 65 percent of the weight of the human body and oxygen is found in the water that makes up the majority of the weight of the body and it's also found in other molecules in the body as well and of course carbon is very important although it really only makes up 18 percent of our body's weight carbon is the basis for all organic molecules that is they all contain carbon hydrogen is also important making up about nine percent of our body weight again it's found in water but it's also found in carbohydrates and fats and other biologically important macromolecules within the body nitrogen is also important about four percent of body weight uh, nitrogen is designated by the chemical symbol N and nitrogen is found in things like amino acids proteins and also nucleic acids and finally calcium is also somewhat important in the body it comprises about two percent of the weight of the body but of course you already know that calcium is very important in the creation of teeth and bones and without calcium we couldn't have proper contraction of the heart so other major elements that are important in the body include phosphorus indicated by chemical symbol P potassium which is indicated by K sulfur S sodium Na chlorine CL and magnesium MG
And finally, there are some trace elements that are important to the human body. We call them trace elements because they're only needed in very, very, very small amounts. In fact, some of them can become very toxic if they're present in larger amounts. And these include things like boron and cobalt and, of course, iron. Iron, designated by the symbol Fe, is very important for the binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin molecule in blood. Copper is also important, as is fluorine and zinc. So these are the important trace elements for the human body. Now these elements and trace elements we've talked about that are important to the human body, uh, I should mention that most often they're not going to be flowing throughout the body in an unbound state. That is, usually they're going to be combined with atoms of other elements to make up compounds. And the thing about an element and a compound is they can have very different chemical properties. For example, let's take a look at sodium. Now sodium by itself is a very malleable, uh, easy to cut metal. It's also very poisonous. Now when I was in high school, people would try to sneak a little bit of sodium out of the chemistry labs and then flush it down the toilets because when it hit water, it would explode. And so if you time the flush just right, you can cause a lot of damage to the sewer system. Now, for obvious reasons, we don't really keep a sodium metal in the chemistry lab anymore. But the important part to realize is that when we combine sodium, which is a poisonous explosive metal with chlorine gas or chloride, we can basically make something that is sodium chloride. And sodium chloride is not toxic, uh, it is not explosive, in fact it's a very necessary compound for the human body. We need sodium chloride for the propagation of nerve impulses, we need it to maintain our blood osmolality, and so the big picture here is that the elements that make up a compound and the compound itself can have very, very different chemical properties. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the chemical properties of the other elements in the periodic table, just click on the link below to go to the web of elements, and you can see what each of these elements looks like in its native state, and also what happens when we combine it with things like water and air. Uh, some of them produce pretty neat explosions and, and are really impressive, and so if you've got a little time to kill, that would be a website that I would really recommend visiting. So now that we've talked about elements, let's go back to talk about atoms. Remember that an atom is the simplest form of an element that still retains all of the chemical and physical properties of that element. And so here we can see an atom of helium. Now atoms have two general regions. They have a nucleus, and surrounding that nucleus they have electron shells. So the nucleus contains two different types of subatomic particles, and the first of these are the protons. Protons have a mass of one atomic mass unit, and they also have a positive one charge. It's very important to realize that each element will have atoms with a certain number of protons, and that atoms usually cannot give up or receive protons, that the number of protons in an atom should always stay the same. The second type of subatomic particle that we find in the nucleus is something called a neutron. As the name implies, neutrons are neutral, that is, they have no charge. But they do have a weight. They have a weight or mass of one atomic mass units. And this is the same as the weight of a proton. Now, unlike protons, the number of neutrons within atoms of an element can sometimes vary. And when this happens, we call these atoms with different numbers of neutrons isotopes. And we'll talk more about isotopes in a few more slides. Now the final type of subatomic particle is called an electron. Electrons are not found in the nucleus, but instead they are found in electron shells that surround the nucleus. Electrons have a negative one charge, that is they have a charge that is opposite the charge of the protons. Now electrons are very, very small, so essentially we say that they do not have a detectable mass. Now, when you go into chemistry class, you'll probably learn a little bit more about this. But for the purposes of this course, we can think of electrons as having a negative charge, but no mass. So this table just shows a summary of the physical properties of each of the three subatomic particles. Remember that a neutron is neutral, and it has no charge. And neutrons reside within the nucleus of an atom. Neutrons do have a weight of one atomic mass unit also found in the nucleus are protons. Think of pro as meaning positive, and so protons have a positive one charge, 
They're also found in the nucleus, and they also have a weight of one atomic mass unit. Okay, the last subatomic particle, the electrons, essentially have no weight or no mass, and they have a negative one charge. Now that we've learned about the three subatomic particles, there are two different numbers that are going to be very important in learning the periodic table. The first of these is called the atomic number, and the atomic number is essentially the number of protons in an atom. For example, carbon has an atomic number of six, which indicates it has six protons. The second number is the atomic mass, sometimes called the atomic weight, and this is simply the mass of the protons plus the mass of the neutrons. And so the atomic mass basically tells you the weight or mass of a single atom of that element. So go ahead and get out your periodic table, and let's take a look at carbon. Carbon has the atomic number of six, which indicates that it has six protons. Now sometimes in some periodic table, you'll see the atomic number up top and the atomic mass on the bottom, and sometimes it'll be flip-flopped. Uh, the way that you can distinguish the atomic number from the atomic mass is that the atomic number is always a whole number with no decimals after it, whereas the atomic mass usually has some decimal places. So we said before that the atomic number is the number of protons in the element. So looking at carbon, it has an atomic number of six, and that tells us that each atom of carbon has six protons. Now here's an important rule for you to memorize. For most atoms, they contain the same number of electrons as protons, and therefore are electrically neutral. For example, carbon has six protons, so it must also have six electrons. Now there will be exceptions when we talk about ions and things like that, but all other things being equal, if you don't know the number of electrons, assume that it's the same as the number of protons. The atomic mass, on the other hand, is approximately equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we already said that we had six protons in the atom, so how many neutrons do you think we have? Well, we can calculate the number of neutrons by simply subtracting the atomic number, the number of protons, from the atomic mass, which was the protons plus the neutrons. So the atomic mass here is approximately 12. We subtract off six protons, and we see that carbon has six neutrons. So one of the things you should be able to do for an exam is, given an element on the periodic table, tell me how many protons, how many electrons, and how many neutrons. You can see that for carbon, the answer to each of these questions is six. Six protons, six electrons, and six neutrons. Okay, a few slides ago we mentioned isotopes, and I just want to go over this in a little bit more detail. So an isotope is an atom of an element that differs in the number of neutrons. For example, let's go back and take a look at carbon. The atomic mass of carbon was 12, which meant that six protons and six neutrons make up that mass. Now if we add an extra neutron to a carbon atom, which can happen, we have C13. Carbon-13 is called an isotope of carbon. It has an abnormal number of neutrons. If we have two additional neutrons, we can have something called carbon-14, which again is another isotope of carbon. Now carbon-12 is by and large the most common of the carbon atoms that are out there, and carbon-13 and carbon-14 are pretty darn rare. But we can use the prevalence of these atoms relative to one another to do a lot of different things. For example, if you look up carbon dating on the internet, you can learn that that's looking at the ratio of carbon-14 and 13 to carbon-12 to find out the approximate, to find out the age of things like very old trees or fossils or clothing or things like that. Now some isotopes are called radioisotopes and that they emit radioactivity. So these are the heavier isotopes of many elements and they spontaneously decay into more stable forms. Now in the process, they emit some energy, some of which can be in the form of gamma rays, and this emitted energy can be useful in the imaging of organs and tissues, and also in the diagnosis and treatment of disease. So here are a couple examples of different types of radioisotopes that are used in medicine. I'm not going to make you memorize which one's which, but I would like you to look up three different techniques at the website below. And these techniques include positron emission tomography, or PET, radionucleotide therapy, RNT, and targeted alpha therapy, TAT. So please take a second and look up these techniques on the website below because there will be a question or two on the exam covering these techniques that utilize radioisotopes.
Now one type of technique that utilizes radioisotopes that you're likely to hear about is something called a PET scan. PET stands for Positron Emission Tomography. And basically this is a way to look at the metabolism of tissues or organs in the body by using a radioactive compound. And so, for example, at the left-hand side, you can see two sections to the brain, and these would be transverse sections. The one on the left is from somebody who has Parkinson's disease, and therefore has had some death of neurons uh, within parts of the brain. The one on the right is a control, that is somebody of approximately the same age, but who does not have Parkinson's disease. And the one on the right, you can see more yellows and reds indicating a higher degree of metabolism, whereas the one at the left, you see less red, mainly just green. And that indicates less metabolism, uh, less active cells in there, indicating that cells have died off. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can also see another use for PET scans, and this can be in evaluating the efficacy of certain types of treatments for cancer. For example, the section on the left with a red in it shows a PET scan of a person that had a certain type of leukemia that is a cancer of the bone marrow. And so the red area is very metabolically active. We're presuming here that it is cancer cells because cancer cells are continuously dividing, have higher metabolisms than normal body cells. Now at the far right you can see the same person, again using PET imaging, but you see a lot less red there. This is the same person after treatment with chemotherapy. But what you'll notice is there's still a lot of yellow and green in there, indicating that there's still residual cancer cells that are active within the vertebrae and also within the proximal parts of the humerus. And so PET scans can be useful at determining just how well our chemotherapy regimen is working. Okay, so we talked about the nucleus of an atom. We said that it contains protons and also neutrons. Now let's talk about what's outside the nucleus, that is the electron shells. Electrons occupy shells outside the nucleus called electron shells. Each shell can only hold a certain number of electrons. For example, the first shell just outside the nucleus can only hold two electrons. The second shell can hold eight electrons and this third shell can hold 18 electrons. Now there can be more shells besides three, but three shells is usually the most number of shells that we're going to see in biologically important molecules. Now the octet rule is a very, very, very important rule when it comes to electron shells and atoms. And it basically states that atoms are most stable, or happy if you want, when the valence or outer electron shell contains eight electrons. For example, here you can see carbon, it consists of six protons, six electrons. Uh, we know that only two electrons can fit in the first shell, and that leaves four electrons for the outer shell. Now because it doesn't have the octet, it doesn't have all eight electrons, carbon is not happy. In this case, it's not stable either. And because it's not stable, it might form compounds or molecules. Now the only exception to this octet rule is if we have an element that has only one electron shell. In that case, if it only has one electron shell, then all that electron shell can fit is two. And if there are two electrons in there, then that atom will also be happy. Now just to reiterate what I said in the previous slide, atoms are most stable when the outer electron shell contains eight electrons. So that's a very important rule. And if you know that rule, you can take a look at atoms of an element and determine whether or not they're likely to form chemical bonds. So here's an example of something that I might give you on a test. For example, I might say draw the electron shell configuration for hydrogen. Look up hydrogen on the periodic table. You see that the atomic number is one. And that means that it has one proton. And if you remember that the number of protons and the number of electrons are usually the same, you know that it has one electron. So we should be able to draw the hydrogen atom. We've got the one proton in the middle and the one electron in the first shell. So I want you to tell me whether or not hydrogen is stable or happy. Well, if you said hydrogen is not stable, you're correct, because it could use an extra electron in that first shell. Now this is an exception to the octet rule, because the first shell cannot fit eight electrons. So in this case, just having two electrons would make hydrogen happy. Now let's look at helium. Helium has an atomic number of two, which indicates it has two protons and two electrons. So here we have our two protons within the nucleus. We also have two neutrons, and we also have two electrons. So is helium stable? 
Well, if you said yes, you're correct. Helium is stable because it only has one electron shell, and that electron shell is completely full with two electrons. And because helium is stable, it's unlikely to form molecules or compounds with other types of atoms. Now let's take a look at a carbon atom. So carbon has the atomic number of 6, so look on the right hand side of your periodic table and find carbon. Now remember that because it has the periodic number of 6, that means it has 6 protons and also 6 electrons. So how many electrons fit in the first shell? Well, 2. So that leaves how many electrons left over? The answer there is 4. So 4 electrons fit in the second shell of carbon. So is carbon stable? Is it happy? Well, if you said no, you're correct, because in this case, for carbon to be happy, we would expect it to have eight electrons in the outer shell to fulfill the octet rule. So because carbon is not happy, it's not stable, what that means is that carbon can form compounds by joining with other atoms. So being able to determine whether or not an atom is stable by looking at the electrons in the outer shell will tell you whether or not it's likely to form molecules and compounds. So an atom that is not stable will typically want to join with other atoms and either share electrons or donate or receive electrons so that it can get as close as possible to fulfilling that octet rule. And so both of these methods that I've described above are ways of forming both molecules and compounds through the formation of chemical bonds. The big picture here is that chemical bonds involve the exchange or sharing of electrons. So we need to go over some vocabulary that pertains to chemical bonds. The first of these is molecule. A molecule is a combination of two or more atoms held together by chemical bonds. Now these can be atoms of the same element or atoms of different elements. For example, one atom of oxygen bound to another atom of oxygen is a molecule of oxygen. On the other hand, one atom of carbon bound to two atoms of oxygen is also a molecule of carbon dioxide. So basically the definition of a molecule is two or more atoms could be the same element, could be different elements that are joined together to form a chemical bond. On the other hand, a compound is a more specific type of molecule. A compound is a chemical bond between atoms of two or more different elements. For example, sodium chloride is a common compound made up of sodium and also chlorine. Methane, CH4, is also a very common compound produced in the large intestines. It doesn't smell too great. It's made up of carbon and four hydrogen atoms. And the compound at the bottom, of course, is glucose, C6H12O6, made up of six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen. So the rule of thumb here is that all compounds are molecules but not all molecules are compounds. In order to be a compound, those atoms joined together must be from two or more different elements, whereas to be a molecule, it just has to be two or more atoms joined together. Could be the same element, could be a different element. Now, while we're on the topic of compounds, we should probably take a diversion here to talk a few minutes about mixtures. We said that compounds and molecules are where we have atoms of elements that are actually chemically bonded to one another. Now mixtures are something different. In mixtures we have elements that are intermixed with one another, or compounds that are intermixed with one another. But the point here is that these substances are physically intermixed, they're not chemically bonded. And so they're easier to separate apart than, let's say, a compound would be. So there's three different types of basic mixtures, and these include solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Now the first type of mixture is something called a solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture of usually a liquid and a solid. And by homogeneous we mean that the solutes are evenly dispersed throughout the solution. So the solutions consist of two parts, the solvent, which is usually the liquid, and the solute, which is usually solid. So the solute becomes dissolved in the solvent. So think about taking sugar or salt and putting it in water. You stir it around and that dissolves to make a solution. Now the concentration of a solution can be expressed as a percent or as molarity. Now percent is probably more common to see in the pharmacological world. So here you can see two different containers, each of which indicates a different percent of the solute. At the lower left, you can see a container of lidocaine. 
Lidocaine is the local anesthetic that we inject in you when we give you stitches and things like that. And you can see here that lidocaine is a 2% solution. And what this means is that we've dissolved 2 grams of lidocaine into approximately 100 milliliters of sterile water to make up this 2% solution. On the other hand, take a look at the uh, picture at right, and you can see 0.9% sodium chloride solution. Now this is the same kind of thing where we have taken a thousand mils of water and we've dissolved nine grams of sodium chloride in it. And we use sodium chloride as a blood expander uh, to basically put in people to keep them hydrated and also prevent them from going into shock if they've had blood loss during surgery. So in both these medications we can express the concentration of the solute in terms of percent. So in addition to having percent solutions, we can also have something called a molar solution. A mole is basically the atomic weight of a compound in grams. For example, let's take a look at carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is made up of one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen. We see on our periodic table that carbon has an atomic weight of 12 and oxygen has an atomic weight of around 16. Now because there's only one carbon, we add 12 and two oxygens, we add 16 plus 16, and we get a weight of around 44. And what this means is that one mole of carbon dioxide would weigh 44 grams. Now, a molar solution, on the other hand, is one mole of the solute divided by one liter of solvent. Now, it's important to point out that each mole of a solute contains a precise number of particles. That is, it contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd solute particles, and we call this number Avogadro's number. Now, we're not going to talk much about molarity or Avogadro's number in this course, but if you go on to take pharmacology and chemistry, you'll certainly see these concepts again. Now, a second type of mixture is something called a colloid. A colloid is a heterogeneous mixture of a solute and a solvent. Now, by heterogeneous, I mean that the solute molecules are not evenly distributed throughout the solvent. The solutes here do not settle out, uh, but they do scatter light that passes through the colloid, and for this reason colloids are sometimes called emulsions. Colloids may undergo sol-gel transformations, that is, sometimes they'll be more liquid-like, and sometimes they'll behave more like a solid. Now, examples of solids include jello, which you see at right, and within the body, things like breast milk and cytosol are also examples of colloids. Another type of mixture is something called a suspension. A suspension is a heterogeneous mixture of large solutes that tend to settle out if left undisturbed. And examples of suspensions here include human blood. Uh, human blood, if you were to draw it out and place it into a test tube, uh, over time, over minutes and hours, uh, the red blood cells and white blood cells are going to tend to settle out, leaving the liquid part, the plasma, at the top. Within the pharmaceutical world, several drugs are also suspensions, and so they consist of uh, basically a powdered medication that's uh, mixed into something called a diluent. And you have to shake that up because over time, that solid part will tend to settle out to the bottom of the jar. Okay, so now that we talked about mixtures and we said that mixtures were basically two or more substances that are physically intermixed, we're going to go back to talk about molecules and compounds. And remember, molecules and compounds are joined together by chemical bonds. And these chemical bonds tend to be quite strong. And normally, it can be quite difficult to separate the components of a molecule or a compound under ordinary means. So there's two different types of chemical bonds we're going to talk about, covalent bonding and ionic bonding. So the first of these methods is called covalent bonding. And it basically involves the sharing of electrons. So a covalent bond is a chemical bond created when atoms fill their outer shells by sharing electrons with other atoms. For example, let's take a look at hydrogen and oxygen. Find hydrogen on the periodic table. Remember that hydrogen has an atomic number of 1. So 1 means that it has 1 proton and 1 electron. Now let's find oxygen. Okay, oxygen has an atomic number of 8, which means it has 8 protons and 8 electrons. So knowing this information, you should be able to draw the electron shell configuration of both oxygen and hydrogen. Now let's see if these atoms are stable. So first off, take a look at oxygen. Remember, oxygen had eight electrons total, 
two in the first shell, leaving six for the second shell. Remember, in order for the atom to be stable and happy, it should have eight electrons in the outer shell. So in this case, it would need two electrons to become stable or happy. Now let's go back and look at hydrogen. Hydrogen has the atomic number of one. Remember, one electron in the first shell. And remember that first shell can only hold two electrons. So at this point, in order to become stable, hydrogen needs only one more electron to become stable. So here you can see two hydrogen atoms, each needs one electron, and one oxygen atom, which needs two electrons. So what do you think will happen? So one way that all of these atoms can become stable is by sharing electrons. So here you can see what happens when the two hydrogens bond to the two unpaired electrons of oxygen. So in essence, what happens is that oxygen now has eight electrons, and hydrogen now has two electrons around it. And this is because the electrons that are traveling around oxygen or hydrogen are moving very, very quickly, spending some time around oxygen and some time around hydrogen. So in essence, by sharing electrons, we have made a molecule and a compound that is much more stable than the individual atoms. And because this chemical bonding involves electron sharing, we call it covalent bonding. Let's take a look at another example. So here we have four atoms of hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen has one electron. And now we have one atom of carbon. Remember that carbon has an atomic number of six, meaning it has six electrons, two of which are in the first shell, leaving the remaining four in the second shell. So how many does carbon need to be happy? Well, it needs four more. So looking at the picture now, you can probably guess what will happen. One atom of carbon binds with four atoms of hydrogen to make methane gas. That's the rather smelly gas that's produced as a byproduct of intestinal digestion. One thing I would like you to notice is that we can also depict this molecule of methane by using a stick and dot formula. So take a look at the figure at right where we have our hydrogens bound to carbon by these little rods indicating the chemical bonds. So each line indicates a pair of electrons being shared. So two atoms can share one pair of electrons, which is a single covalent bond, or they can share two pairs of electrons, which is a double covalent bond. Double covalent bonds are indicated by a double line. And finally, triple covalent bonds indicate three pairs of electrons are being shared. Again, here we indicate the three pairs of electrons by three horizontal lines. Now, as you can imagine, a double covalent bond is stronger than a single covalent bond, and a triple covalent bond is both stronger and shorter than either a double or a single covalent bond. So here are some examples of common organic molecules. Methane is the one that we already showed. That is one carbon atom bound to four hydrogen atoms. Ethane, on the other hand, is two carbon atoms bound to six hydrogen atoms. And ethene is two carbon atoms bound to four hydrogen atoms. So at most, carbon can bind with four other things, and it's the basis for organic molecules. But look what happens when we form double bonds. When we have a double bond, as in ethene, we can only bind with three different atoms. And so the number of bonds we have with an atom determines how many different atoms we can bind with. Ethene has a double bond with the other carbon, and so that carbon can only bind to two hydrogens. So covalent bonding was a way to make atoms stable by sharing electrons between adjacent atoms. Basically, the sharing of electrons forms chemical bonds. Another type of bonding is called ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are chemical bonds created when atoms fill their outer electron shells by either giving up electrons or receiving electrons from other atoms. Before we go on to talk about ionic bonding, we should first define what an ion is. An ion is a charged atom, that is, an atom that has either given up or received electrons, and therefore has a net charge. Remember I said previously that in most atoms the number of electrons and the number of protons is the same. Well, that's usually the case unless we give up an electron or we receive an electron. In that case, we become a charged particle called an ion. So this charge is indicated by either a positive or negative symbol following the chemical symbol for that element. For example, Na positive is a cation indicating that sodium is positively charged. Now the way that sodium becomes positively charged is by losing electrons. On the other hand, take a look at the chloride ion, Cl negative. 
Now this negative indicates that we have a negative one charge. That is, we've picked up an extra electron to become negatively charged. Negatively charged ions are called anions. So go back to your periodic table and we're going to take a look at sodium Na and chlorine Cl. Now first let's take a look at sodium. The atomic number for sodium is 11. And what this means is it has 11 protons and normally 11 electrons. So where would these electrons go? Well remember the first two go in the first shell and that leaves eight electrons for the second shell giving us a total of ten meaning that the last electron must exist in the third shell. Now remember in order to become stable sodium would need to have eight electrons in that outer shell but now it only has one and what's the likelihood it's going to find seven other atoms to share with? Now let's take a look at chlorine. Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. That means two electrons go in the first shell, eight in the second shell giving us 10, and seven in the outer shell. So it's just one electron shy of having the full eight in the outside shell. So what do you think will happen? Well what happens is that sodium which has only one electron in the outer shell will actually give up that outer electron and once it does this you can think of that outer shell as sort of disappearing and that one extra electron will travel over to chlorine and so by giving up one electron sodium now has eight electrons in the outer electron shell and by receiving that extra electron chlorine now has eight electrons in its outer shell so now both sodium and chlorine are stable but wait don't forget that the transfer of electrons has changed the overall net charge of both atoms now remember that sodium originally had eleven protons and eleven electrons but in the process of bonding it gave up an electron so now it has eleven protons and ten electrons which means it has one more positive than negative so it has an overall positive one charge now let's look at chlorine chlorine had originally seventeen protons and seventeen electrons but it gained an extra electron it now has eighteen electrons and that means it has an overall negative one charge so both sodium and chloride at this point are now called ions and these are oppositely charged ions and what do we know about opposites that's right they attract the negatively charged chloride ion will be bound or attracted to the positively charged sodium ion so here's some examples of ions we have hydrogen ions potassium ions fluorine ions calcium ions and so on now remember that ions are created through either donating or receiving electrons we really can't give up a proton and so how did hydrogen get a positive charge? Well it got a positive one charge by giving up a single electron. Now let's take a look at fluorine. Fluorine has a negative charge. How did it get that? Well it received an extra electron. And finally let's look at calcium. Calcium has a positive two charge and this indicates that it's given up two electrons. In addition we can have complex ions which are ions containing atoms of two or more elements. For example hydroxide ions phosphate ions and acetate ions. So, so far we've talked about two different types of chemical bonding. Covalent bonding where atoms will share electrons and ionic bonding where atoms either give up or receive electrons. Both of these are methods of forming very strong chemical bonds in between individual atoms. Now we're going to go talk about something called hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonding involves temporary associations between molecules these really aren't full-on chemical bonds and one of the molecules that forms hydrogen bonds is water water is a molecule that is composed of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom which are covalently bound to one another that is through electron sharing but the electron sharing in water is a little bit unequal and this gives water some unique properties first of all water has a very high heat capacity meaning it absorbs a lot of heat before it changes temperature itself. It has a high heat of vaporization. That means that when it evaporates it can take a lot of heat away with it and this works to our advantage when we sweat because it really helps to dissipate heat. And finally water is a very polar substance and this polarity makes it an excellent solvent. And so we'll talk more about polarity in the subsequent slides.
So remember back to a few slides ago when we said that water was created through covalent bonding. And covalent bonding was basically electron sharing. Now I want you to think about the concept of sharing. Have you ever shared anything with somebody? Have you ever shared, for example, a car with your spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend? If so, was this sharing always equal? Chances are you'll probably say no. One of you got the car more than the other, which is the case of what happened with my wife and I. Uh, we had one car, and basically she had it all the time, and I rarely had it. And this is what happens with electron sharing in the water molecule. The oxygen atom is much more greedy, and we call this greediness electronegativity. And what this does is it causes the electrons to spend more time around oxygen and less time around hydrogen. So even though electrons are being shared, they're being shared unequally. And this results in a partial negative charge around the oxygen atom and a partial positive charge around the hydrogen atoms. Again, these aren't full-on negative and positive charges, but just polarity. A little bit of positive charge on the hydrogen, a little bit of negative charge on the oxygen. Now, what do we know about opposites? That's right, they attract. And so when we have lots of water molecules adjacent to one another, they tend to form a temporary associations based on the partial positive and partial negative charges. Remember that the hydrogen has a partial positive charge, and that the oxygens have a partial negative charge. And so the oxygen of one molecule will line up with the hydrogen of the other molecules to give themselves these temporary associations. Now these really aren't chemical bonds per se in that they're not forming compounds and they're also very, very easy to break. Anytime you run your hand through water, you're breaking millions upon millions of hydrogen bonds very, very easily. But hydrogen bonds do give water some unique properties that aren't present in other liquids. For example, high surface tension. Now the surface tension is created when we have a still bowl or a cup of water and you can see that there's a little bit of a skin to it. If you have a very steady hand and a very clean cup of water, you can actually float paper clips on top of this water because of the surface tension. Now surface tension is also utilized by insects like water striders which will actually walk on top of the water. They're actually more dense or heavier than water but because of the surface tension they can actually walk on top without falling in there. Now if you were to do the same experiment with the paper clips and then put a drop of soap in there, what do you think is going to happen? Well the soap is going to break up the surface tension causing those paper clips to plummet to the bottom of the cup. So just a review on the chemical bonds. There are two different types of bonds which can make compounds, and these include covalent bonding, which involves electron sharing, and ionic bonding, which involves either donating or receiving electrons. The third type of bond, hydrogen bonding, results because there's unequal sharing of electrons within a molecule resulting in polarity. And because of polarity, one molecule will line up in a certain way with another molecule, forming a temporary association, but not a real chemical bond. Okay, now that we've talked about the way in which compounds are formed through either ionic or covalent bonds, we need to talk about certain types of chemical reactions. There's three major types of chemical reactions. The first of these is called a synthesis reaction. Remember, synthesize means to make something. And so in a synthesis reaction, we have two reactants, here called A and B, that result in a single product. For example, imagine taking one atom of hydrogen and another atom of hydrogen, combining them using covalent bonding, and then you make H2, or hydrogen gas. This would be an example of a synthesis reaction. Synthesis reactions are anabolic. Remember, anabolic means to build. That's because we take two smaller substrates, add them together to make a larger product. Our next reaction is called a decomposition reaction. Decomposition indicates that it's a catabolic reaction. That is, we're going to have a large molecule that we break down into smaller parts. For example, we could take water, pass electricity through it, and produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Now, oftentimes, decomposition reactions release energy. And finally, the third type of reaction is called an exchange or displacement reaction, which involves both synthesis and decomposition. That is, bonds are both being made and also broken. In an exchange reaction, parts of the reactant molecules change partners, producing different product molecules.
Another important type of chemical reaction that happens in biological systems is something called an oxidation reduction reaction, or redox reaction for short. This basically entails a combination of a decomposition and exchange reactions, and it's very useful for fueling cellular processes. And remember, here we're talking about electrons that are being exchanged. We have one atom that's giving up electrons, which we say is oxidized, and one atom that is receiving electrons, which we say is reduced. So oxidation, remember, entails removal of electrons from a molecule, and in this case it results in a decrease in the potential energy of that molecule. And so it releases energy, that is, it's a catabolic process. It's important to realize that most biological oxidations also involve the loss of hydrogens, so we sometimes call them dehydrogenation reactions. Reduction, on the other hand, results in the addition of electrons to a molecule. By adding electrons, we increase the energy content of that molecule, and so reduction is an anabolic process. So in essence, the oxidation-reduction reaction is a combination of anabolic and catabolic reactions. We're using the catabolic reaction to generate energy to fuel the anabolic reaction. There is a very popular mnemonic device that can help you to remember the difference between oxidation and reduction, and that is the term oil rig. Oil rig basically stands for oxidation is loss of electrons, where reduction is gain of electrons. And remember, when we lose electrons, our energy state goes down, whereas when we gain electrons, our energy state goes up. So here's an example of a redox or oxidation reduction reaction, and this is cellular respiration. We take some glucose, add some oxygen, and use some enzymes to catabolize or break that glucose down into carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Now take a look at the hydrogens. Originally all the hydrogens were within glucose, which is a large molecule, but at the other side of the equation we can see that the hydrogens are now bound to what was free oxygen. That is, it was free oxygen on the left side of the equation, but it becomes water on the right side of the equation. So oxygen has become reduced by the hydrogens, whereas glucose has become oxidized by the oxygen. And so remember, oxidation reduction involves both anabolic and catabolic processes. Now we can also classify reactions based on energy flow. Exergonic reactions are reactions that release energy. For example, cellular respiration is overall an exergonic reaction. It releases energy that can be used to fuel cellular processes. On the other hand, endergonic reactions absorb energy. They produce products that have more energy than the reactants. So the opposite, for example, of cellular respiration would be when plants absorb carbon dioxide and they use sunlight to basically reduce that carbon dioxide into glucose. And that would be an example of an anabolic or endorgonic reaction. Remember, endorgonic means it needs energy or absorbs energy. Okay, that concludes part one of the lecture on chemistry. There is a second part that's available within the same folder as this lecture, so make sure that you watch that lecture before going on to take this week's La Lima quiz.